Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for another webinar. We're very happy to have Dr. Robin Alter back with us to talk about how to support our kids with special needs during the COVID-19 outbreak. So I'm, I'm very excited for this particular topic and it, I know that it's been one that has been requested. Uh, so I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, before I pass it on to Robin, I'd like to just share a couple of housekeeping items. Um, so uh, we are recording this and uh, we have been oversubscribed. Uh, you might have received an email. So uh, if you're unable to, uh, to, to get in or if you need to step away from uh, this webinar today, just know that it is recorded and you will receive it by email in the next few days. Uh, it's also um, along with all of our other webinars, it's posted on our website. So I'd encourage you to take a look there. Uh, we will be uh, having some time at the end of the uh, presentation for questions, so please start loading up your questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'd love to uh, be able to answer as many as we can, so uh, that'll be the place where we'll go to find them. Great. And if you have any technical challenges with Zoom, I'd ask you to reach out to our, my colleague, Pamela Sarianis. This is her email address here, and, uh, and we'll be sure to, to support you as, as best as we can. I did want to get a chance to see, I know that um, Robin and I are both interested in who's joining us today. So I'm gonna uh, launch a poll, and I'd love to hear, um, who is joining us today? Are you a professional that works with children? Are you a parent? Maybe you're both. Thanks very much for uh, helping us to get a sense of who's in the room. And certainly you're open to sharing uh, in the chat. I can already see that there's a lot of people that are uh, saying hellos in the chat. So that's really great to see. Okay, we'll just get a, a bit of a snapshot. Looks like we've got a lot of professionals that work with children, so thanks very much. I know that a lot of people are using our webinars as professional development opportunities, so thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I've got one, no, we've got another poll that I'd love to share with you. Um, and that is, uh, did you watch Robin's first webinar? So, um, as you know, um, we've been running webinars for the last couple of months and uh, Dr. Alter was one of our uh, first uh, guest, uh, guest hosts and so just to be able to get a sense of um, the material and, uh, and what, uh, um, what we might want to cover. So we can see that it looks like the majority are, are new. So I'll just end that just to get a snapshot again. Okay, well, welcome. So just- uh, Mandy, Mandy, yeah. can you hear me? Maybe we could do one more poll and ask the new people if they watched the webinar. They may uh, not have been here, but maybe they watched it. Yeah, I wouldn't be able to do that just yet, um, Robin, as I have to go into the back end to do that. Okay, all, all right, that. never mind. Great, okay. So we can uh, share a little bit more about uh, the Psychology Foundation of Canada. Um, Robin, can we move on to our next slide? I will have to get some things off the screen here. <laughs> okay. Okay, I want to introduce you to Dr. Robin Alter. Um, Dr. Alter is a registered clinical psychologist in practice since 1979, and she's consulted with the Children's Mental Health System in Toronto and York Region for over 40 years. Robin has a comprehensive private practice offering assessment and treatment of children, adolescents, and adults. Uh, and she's taught courses in psychology at York University and is the author of a uh, few books, including Anxiety and the Gift of Imagination and the Anxiety Workbook for Kids. And I'm very pleased to uh, share with you that Dr. Alter is an ongoing trustee with the Psychology Foundation of Canada for, for the past 10 years and uh, has supported our, our committees as well. So, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alter, once again, for joining us again. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, a little bit about the Psychology Foundation of Canada, if you're not familiar with us. We're an organization that's been around for over 45 years. Our focus is on nurturing resilience with children, and we do this through the use of psychological science. Um, we've got a number of programs that span the developmental years. 
and um, we... My screen, sorry, Mandy, but my screen is not moving forward. Okay. If you just uh, maybe just click the, the mouse and then uh, try your uh, forward button, your arrow. Oh, oh okay, go. got it. Okay, good. There you go. We're, we're all learning, right? This is just a, this is <laughs> such a great, uh, <laughs> great opportunity to learn more about technology. Um, so uh, our programs run across the, uh, the span of development and we start at birth with Make the Connection. This is a program where we are working with parents and caregivers to encourage that secure attachment with their children. So this is a program where we work oftentimes um, with uh, public health nurses and ECEs, and uh, we really work on uh, ensuring that that secure attachment is something that will last throughout a young person's life. We move on through into the school years with Kids Have Stress Too and with Stress Lessons. These are uh, stress management programs. We teach kids how to uh, cope and manage with their stress. And then finally, we've got something for adults too with our Stress Strategies program. Um, so I'd encourage you to ch take a look at stressstrategies.ca. This is um, a, a tool where you can insert uh, a challenge that you might be facing and it'll help you to determine an action plan to move forward. And more specifically about our Kids Have Stress Too and Stress Lessons, as I mentioned, these are stress management programs. They're evidence-based, they've been researched. And it's really a matter of uh, teaching these tangible stress management skills and, and strategies to young people, both in and out of the classroom. At uh, this time, we are offering our Kids Have Stress Too and Stress Lessons um, uh, training programs online. So if you're interested, I'd encourage you to take a look at our website. And here's our stress strategies. This is, uh, once again, a, a personalized pathway for how to live a stress-free or stress-managed lifestyle. Uh, so uh, this is also a great tool to be used with uh, uh, older children. Um, so it might be something that um, parents and teenagers can do together. Okay, over okay. to you, Robin. Okay, thank you, Mandy. So first of all, I want to say to welcome everybody and say how privileged I feel to be here uh, work, uh, speaking to so many people who work with children, who have dedicated their lives to working with children. Um, I think it's a calling uh, and I think, uh, you know, I admire all of you because uh, I've been there, I've done, I've been working with children for all, all most of my career and um, I have the utmost respect for the work that you do. So I hope that what I have to say today will be helpful to you. I've, I'm trying very hard to um, give you things that are tangible and useful in this trying time. I put this slide up um, because I think we're, many of us are feeling this way, at least sometimes during the day. And as this, uh, the last time we did this webinar, it was kind of in the beginning of this, but now we're three months into it. And, um, you know, we're all, you know, the stress is, is not going away and probably getting worse. Um, <clears throat> I also want to say before I start that the topic um, is very broad and um, you know I'm not going to be able to um, cover a, a, a tremendous amount on each of these topics so I'm trying to give you I will try to give you something useful in each of these topics that you can take away and I, and I don't consider myself an expert on everything nobody is <laughs> Um, we're all learning, we're all doing our best. So, you know, please, um, um, you know, try these things, um, stick with them for a while. I'm gonna talk about that, uh, you know, what happens when we don't stick with things for a while. But, you know, if you don't, if you disagree or you don't find it useful, you know, move on. So what we're gonna talk about are strategies or ways of understanding um, these uh, different topics and how to adapt strategies um, for children with specific issues. Um, so we're going to discuss um, children with ADHD, um, anxiety reactions, uh, children on the autism spectrum. I know some of you asked some specific questions about that. Anger issues and also depression, loss or grief. So please keep in mind, um, all children with a diagnosis are different. Um, one size never fits all. You know, every person is unique. 
So, um, um, you know, even though you have the same diagnosis, doesn't mean you're identical to another person with that diagnosis. Diagnoses, uh, you know, are kind of shortcuts and lump people in categories. And then, you know, we have strategies that may or may not work with those people with that diagnosis. So um, it's important to remember that. All diagnoses are on a continuum, um, you know, so you can be mild, medium, severe ADHD. Um, and even if you haven't got a diagnosis, you can have symptoms that are similar to people with those diagnoses. So, you know, many of these strategies that I'm going to talk about may help people even if they don't have a diagnosis because they're showing symptoms that are consistent with that diagnosis. Um, another very important point, I can't stress this enough, is that no strategy or very rarely do they work immediately. Um, and um, you know, people often give up on them because they don't work immediately. And that's true for you know, the families, for the parents, as well as the, the worker, as the professional who is working with the family. Um, nothing, you know, th think of, you know, most of these strategies are intended to help people develop better habits. And a habit is really, you know, you've developed a habit when your brain has developed a new pathway. <laughs> you know, think about other habits or skills that you you develop. Like think about coaches and kids learning soccer skills or basketball skills. They practice those skills a thousand times before they become automatic. You don't, you know, the first time you try to get the ball in the hoop um, or connect with the baseball, it, it doesn't work. And it often doesn't work for quite a few years until you, it becomes more reliable. Um, and so we work at it, you know, developing over, you know, over and over again, we practice the same skills. Well, it's similar in our work too. So, you know, we have to caution families that this is, this may not work the first time and you may have to do things over and over again before they become automatic. So we have to be consistent and not give up on it. Um, and even when they are habits, they don't always work. So, you know, we are humans, we are not robots. And, um, you know, even the computer, which is sort of a robot, doesn't work every single time as we showed we showed a few minutes ago. And so, um, you know, we, we need to understand that and not expect 100% compliance. Um, and another thing I wanted to keep in mind before we get into the specifics of different categories of, um, you know, you can have the best strategies in the world. Um, and um, if kids won't use them, they're not very helpful. So one of our jobs is to motivate kids, to get them to want to use the strategies. And that's, that's the hard part, um, um, but the very important part. I, many times uh, parents come to see me in my practice and they say, I don't know, I must have the wrong strategies. Um, you know, I hope you have better ones than I do. And in fact, it's, it's not that they don't have, you know, the right strategies and oftentimes they have very good strategies, but their kids are not motivated to use them. Um, I wanted to offer some general guidelines that apply to all kids. Some of this was, was sp spoken about in the previous webinar, but I see that we have quite a few newcomers, so I'm glad I'm the repeating them. Um, and these are things that I'm sure you, you know, we know, but they're, they're just reminders that all children need love, support, and connection. As a matter of fact, adults do too, but we can live without it for a shorter, you know, for some time because we're independent, you know, we can take care of ourselves. Children are still dependent and they're not as self-reliant as adults. And so they need um, the support of a loving adult. Um, we all need social supports. We all need people around us. We, we don't exist on very well on our own. Of course, children need good nutrition, attention to cleanliness and hygiene and adequate sleep. I really want to emphasize the sleep one. Um, I've, I've done maybe 
close to 5,000 psychological assessments in my career. I asked parents to always fill out a developmental form. And I would say between 70 and 80% of all of the clients who've come to me over the years, who've I've done assessments for, identify sleep as a problem. So if your clients and if your children are, are not having good sleep or not having enough sleep, this should become an area of intervention because kids who are deprived of sleep or who have inadequate sleep are um, uh, can be uncooperative and grumpy and non-compliant. And you may then think that that's a sign of their ADHD or a sign of, um, of, um, of depression or something else. But in fact, it may be connected to their lack of sleep. And if you focus on the sleep issues, um, you know, some of the symptoms may go away. I do have some stuff on my website, uh, docrobin.com. Um, that talks about how to get kids to sleep. Um, everyone does better with structure, routine, and um, some elements of ritual. Um, basically, structure, routine, give us a sense of order and predictability and security. And um, this is something that children are very much missing these days during this crisis if they're not attending school, which all of our kids aren't. So some kids are attending, have some structure connected with online learning, but um, you know, it doesn't have to be as tight a structure as school, but you know, some basic um, structure at home can make kids feel much more secure at home. I did have a notice saying some people are raising their hands. I'm not, I don't get to see people here. So I think if you put your questions in the chat, uh, Mandy will handle them and we will have time afterwards to um, uh, answer those questions. If they're technical questions, uh, please let Mandy know and Pamela can help you with those. Um, children, um, you know, this is my opinion, you know, after being in the field as long as I have, I do feel that children are not strong enough emotionally to deal with a lot of the harsh realities of life. And we do need to protect them and shield them um, until they are capable of dealing with them. And I think, you know, if you're a professional, you can work with the parents, um, you know, they're, you know, once you know the child and certainly the parent knows the child and they may have more than one child and some people, some children can handle the truth, whereas other kids need to need to be protected. So, you know, this is about um, keeping people, kids away from the TV or um, the phone. And, uh, you know, we've just gone through this period where um, there were some horrible videos, horrible for adults to watch and even more damaging for children to watch about police brutality. And, um, you know, think about what, you know, I, I heard actually some children on the radio who uh, had seen those videos and were, uh, were traumatized by them. Literally, they were saying things like, maybe I should never go to school, I may get shot. Um, you know, what's gonna happen to me if I go outside? So um, um, I, I think, you know, we need to be very vigilant about, you know, see, making sure that children are not exposed to videos that they really can handle. And children need reassurance and predictability and, um, you know, it may be difficult at this time because we're not feeling very reassured and we have um, lots of questions, um, but I think it's still helpful to reassure our kids in, in some way where we're not, you know, um, being dishonest with them, but, you know, saying reassuring things that things will get better um, is very helpful to all of us. <laughs> um, as I said before, children need, you know, a lot of research shows that positive outcomes come with a strong but positive bond with a caring adult. And, you know, during this time when children are um, spending more time with family, more time with parents. Um, it, it's, you know, and I think there's a lot of stress out there that parents feel that they're not getting, they're, they're getting behind in their schoolwork, they're falling behind, they're not getting as much instruction, but it, it is a time that they can spend more time with, um, 
with their with their parent and strengthening that um, posit that positive bond with a caring adult. We also know from research that children learn a lot through play. So the times that we're playing with our kids, it's not wasted time. It's very, very important time um, because that bond is getting strengthened. Children are learning. They're learning social skills. They're learning math skills. There's all kinds of things that, that are learned through play. And, um, you know, it's always been the case that the children don't really want their parents to be their teachers. They, they see them as different roles. So, um, um, you know, this is a very trying time for parents who are trying to take over the job of teachers. Okay, so that's a general overview and some things to remember. But now let's get into talking about um, anxiety issues. Um, and I can't imagine an anxious child who's not even more anxious these days <laughs> because anxiety is everywhere. Um, and let's, anxiety is that feeling that something is terribly wrong or is going to be wrong, but everyone around us is telling us that everything is all right. Um, and anxiety, in, in my view, I've written a book about it, that it often, not 100%, but often has a lot to do with imagination. And when you have a vivid, highly developed imagination, which everybody agrees is a very good thing, what you feel, which is your anxiety feelings, are connected to what's happening in your imagination, not necessarily what's rooted in reality. So let's try to get clarity about definitions because there's a lot of uh, misconceptions out here. And um, these, these, defin these words are used interchangeably when in fact they're really not, dis not really the same thing. So fear um, is a normal and sensible response to something that could realistically cause harm. Fear is an important and has an important and useful purpose. So um, um, we don't want to get away away from fear. We don't want to eradicate fear because um, sometimes we have to act based on um, uh, something that's a very real has real potential to cause harm. In fact, right now. Um, we are all behaving in very different ways because we are, um, we have fear um, um, of the coronavirus. And, and if we didn't have that fear, we wouldn't be self-isolating, we wouldn't be quarantining, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be staying home, we wouldn't be wearing masks. Um, it's because of that fear is driving our behavior. And that's a very good thing. So it's a good example of how fear is, has a purpose. Anxiety, however, is a response in our bodies. It's a physiological um, and psychological response that's similar to fear, but anxiety is, is a response to events or things that are either not dangerous at all or much less harmful than the person imagines. So uh, claustrophobia is an example, a trip to the dentist, you know, people in, that are claustrophobic are afraid of small spaces because they think they're going to suffocate or the space is going to collapse on them. In fact, small spaces aren't going to harm us at all. Um, a trip to the dentist, you know, may cause a little bit of pain, but, you know, mostly it's uh, something that's uh, very um, beneficial to us. And we often have anxiety in anticipation to something being threatening. And so we think about what's going to happen. Uh, stress, however, is a physical, ph physiological response to an external threat that can be either real or imagined. So um, um, the interesting thing here is that if you look at the, what happens physiologically in your body, fear, anxiety, and stress, are very similar, you know. Um, you get a cortisol reaction, you know, which is your your fight or flight reaction, and um, you might feel um, nauseous in your stomach and jittery, and all of these things uh, come from fear, come from anxiety, come from stress. So a lot of the difference is it's not the physiological difference that differentiates 
differentiates these three. Rather, it's the what we say about it. Is this a real thing that I'm afraid of? Is this uh, something that I'm blowing out of proportion or something that's not dangerous at all? Or have I gotten stressed for some other reason? Am I an overload? Am I, you know, um, thinking that something is going to harm me? And this is a quote that I got from uh, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States. And he said, how much pain has cost us from the evils which have never happened. So this speaks a lot to the anxiety reaction where we are, are very anxious and fearful and really in truth, nothing happens. So um, I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but I wanted to talk about why do we have an imagination in the first place if it causes us so much trouble. Um, and, uh, you know, we play with possibilities, we prepare for the future, you know, kids use their imagination to play out roles, they play doctor, they play mother, father, they play business person, you know, um, um, and we use, we all use our imaginations to get away from unpleasant realities. So this little girl is at a, an adult party, um, you know, very boring, blah, 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 blah. And so she, in her imagination, she's flying away with her little dog, going to a castle, probably to visit some princesses there. So we can daydream and um, escape unpleasant situations. Um, there's a man, um, a psychologist at Harvard by the name of Paul Harris, who wrote a book called The Work of the Imagination. And Paul Harris writes, children and adults alike, have the capacity to get absorbed in a pretend world. Once we enter that state of absorption, it's the event occurring within the imagined world that drive our emotional system. Even if we know it's imaginary, it's a very powerful thing, our imagination. It, it drives our emotional system. So it's not always rooted in reality and very often it's not. And therefore, our imagination can either work for us or against us. So here's a little guy. He's got this little doggy wagging its tail, looking pretty harm harmless to most of us. But to him, it's a vicious dog with huge canine teeth, and it's about to attack him or be very harmful. So, and he's scared. Um, here's a, a, a boy with a needle phobia, you know, the doctor turns around, says, I'm going to get that needle ready. And in his mind, the needle is enormous. And it's just you know, going to go such a big needle, it's going to go right through his arm. And uh, so he is terrified. And this little girl has a stomach ache. Um, and, uh, you know, probably is going to go away in an hour or two. But in her mind, she's, she's in the hospital. She's hooked up to all kinds of machines. You know, there's the doctor. Everybody's fretting. You know, she's, um, there's going to be a horrible outcome here. Now, all of this is happening in the imagination. So um, if we think about the imagination in COVID, um, the, the threat is real you know, very definitely, which is why we're social distancing and self-isolating. But there's a lot that's not known. You know, every day we're, we're reading the newspapers and trying to figure out, have we learned anything new yet? Uh, do we know when we're going to open? What are the facts? What it, you know, are decisions being made on the basis of facts or what are they being made on? And this is fertile ground for the imagination and fertile ground for kids. Because, um, you know, what's happening in kids' minds are things like, am I ever going to go back to school? Am I ever going to see my friends? Will I ever go see people that I have to travel to get to? Um, will I die? Will I get sick? And, um, you know, so our job as adults is to try to help them, um, you know, not react so much to the speculations and the fantasies, but stay grounded in reality. What do, we, what do we know? You know, things like this have happened before and life does get back to normal. We don't know when, but it will. Those kinds of statements can um, um, help kids differentiate fantasy from reality. Now, these are some of the strategies that I have used. Um, I'm gonna give you some of my strategies, some of other people's strategies. 
how can we tame this imagination? A lot of my book is about that. We need to be in charge of it. We don't want to just go wherever the imagination wants to go because it often goes to places that are scary um, and anxiety provoking. So um, one of the ways is to use a worry box. And, um, you know, adults, what we do is we compartmentalize things. You know, we, we might get worried thoughts, but we put them aside for a while, you know, if we're being with our kids or, you know, we put things in compartments. One of the ways we do this is to write things down. Um, I use this before I go to sleep at night. I write everything down so that I don't have to think about it. I don't have to go over and over in my head. I, you know, I look at the list when I wake up in the morning and then I've got my marching orders for the day. So kids really need a concrete place to put their worries. And um, so um, this was developed at Hinks Delcrest many years ago by Florence Chu. Um, it's called a worry box. You can just grab a, um, a shoe box and decorate it. And um, the kids put their worries in the box. And you know, you say, okay, now they're there, you know, we'll, we'll take them out when we want to deal with them. You certainly can find out very concretely what they're worried about by doing this. Some kids, um, it's a very useful thing to do before they go to sleep if they're having sleep problems. Some kids don't care where the worry box is. Other kids want it out of the, out of the room. They, some kids want it in the closet. But um, it's a very useful thing to put the worries away, have them for, in some place for safekeeping. And um, um, it's a lot easier for some kids to do this than to just say that they you know, not going to worry. Um, for sure, tell them that you get it, you know, that something doesn't feel right for them. You're not going to just talk them out of it. You know, that's, that's just, you know, don't worry about that. Tell them, I get it. You're really worried about that. Validate it. And then help them to ride it out. You know, worries and anxiety reactions are physiological. They're, they're very similar to fear reactions and stress reactions. Certain chemicals, certain, um, Hormones have been released in the body uh, when we get very panicked um, that don't feel good. And take, that takes a little while for those substances to get reabsorbed. And to, so we get back to a feeling of neutral and you know, have that good feeling. So you know, this too shall pass. Use breathing techniques, which I'm sure many of you have. Um, because when your breathing calms down, when your breathing actually slows down, it's very difficult to, to be anxious. Um, or when we're anxious, our breathing changes. So if we use these breathing techniques, I really like the 478, which was developed by Andrew Weil, W-E-I-L-L. -L. You can find it on the internet's uh, breathing technique. And you do this, uh, you breathe in for the count of four, you hold it for seven, and you breathe out for eight. And again, the kids may not be able to do this the first time or the second time, but if you stick with it, they can learn it. And um, when you do this four times, the next breath is very long and deep because you've been a little oxygen deprived. And so your body is looking for that oxygen and it takes you right into a very relaxing breathing. Anxiety hijacks us into the future. Um, most many many kids will ask questions about well what's going to happen what if what if what if this happens what if this happens and they go into all of those possibilities in fact there's a um one of the strategies of stress has two is called what if <laughs> um, but it's important to bring them back um to the here and now and five things that the, the, something something concretely you can do to bring kids into the here and now when they're thinking too much into the future is ask them what are five things you see, four things you hear, three things you feel against your skin, two things you smell, and one thing you can taste right now, not what you can you know what you can feel against your skin or hear in the future, but what are you feeling, seeing, feeling, smelling, tasting right now? And, um, and um, remember that adults are more in touch with reality and, and know that, you know, everything, you know, whatever it is that they're anxious about is not going to probably occur. Um, 
Um, and so we need to um, support them to ride it out. And these are some strategies. There, there are two um, places that I like to go to um, to get strategies. One is called GoZen, and they're available online. And the other one is called uh, Hey Sigamund, S-I-G-A-M-U-N-D, uh, Karen Young from Australia. So um, I, I recommend both of them very, very highly. Um, GoZen has lovely little um, animations, little, um, and kids really love them. And so they demonstrate lots of strategies and things that kids can do. So um, um, Renee Jane, who started GoZen, um, suggests that you can get rid of, of anxious thoughts by howling. Ow! You can get rid of anxious thoughts by talking to yourself like your own best friend. I've used this strategy many, many times. And I, you know, if kids are being very down on themselves or yelling at themselves or telling themselves that they're not going to be able to manage a situation, I would say to them, well, if, you're, if your best friend was saying this, what would you say to them? And they would probably give the best advice. You know, we often talk to other people in a much kinder voice than we talk to ourselves. I think this is a good strategy for adults too who are down on themselves because our own voice to ourselves can be very harsh. So if we talk out loud to ourselves as if we're talking to somebody else, you know, it sounds like we're being a little bit crazy, but um, our voice changes and we actually talk nicer. Um, you can get rid of anxious thoughts by throwing them in the trash, um, putting them down the garburator, um, um, putting it into a balloon and sending that balloon away. You can get rid of anxious thoughts by making fun of your thoughts, doing a, you know, um, you know, just uh, being silly and um, uh, making fun of it. You can sing. Um, and, and, and Gozen also has a thing that anxious thoughts somehow stick to us. They, we can't get rid of them. And so how would you get rid of um, paste or gum or something that might be sticking to you and um, use those same, you know, you don't know how to actually do it, but in your imagination, you're getting rid of something sticky. Um, helping children uh, diagnose. So let's move on to ADHD. Um, um, I'm just wondering about our timing. Robin, uh, uh, if you want to continue, perhaps we can extend the webinar today. Oh, okay. Great. That. Okay, yeah. we can do that. Okay. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, so um, let's uh, move on to children with ADHD. Um, so, um, so what I have here is a brain, um, and um, um, of course, the colors don't matter. You know, the colors were just done to accentuate the different parts of your brain. But I, I like to use this because it shows where ADHD is. This, this here is right by your forehead and behind your forehead. And this is um, behind the frontal lobe. It's called the prefrontal lobe. And there's many studies now which show that this is where ADHD is. And um, so this part of your brain, and I'm going to come back to this um, diagram, um, the, um, the functions of the frontal and the prefrontal lobe are areas where we focus our attention. Um, these are the areas that focus our attention. Um, the ability to predict the consequences of our actions, to think about things before we do them, to anticipate what's going to happen in the environment, to control our impulses, to manage our emotional reactions, and to plan for the future. So you can see that these are very, very important parts of um, emotional intelligence um, that we're all talking about. And of course, with ADHD, these are um, um, the um, sustained attention, um, impulsivity, hyperactivity, poor response inhibition, and disinhibition. So there's a lot of noise outside. Uh, is it interfering, do you think, Mandy? Should I be closing my windows? I can hear you. It's okay. okay good. Let me know if there's a problem with the sound. 
So um, there's something called the nine second rule. And if I was sitting in front of you now, I would say how many people have heard of the nine second rule? Because it's really critical for teaching kids behavioral control and emotional control. It takes nine seconds for the activity of the brain to move from the back of the brain, the, the limbic system, to the prefrontal cortex. So I'm gonna go back to our thing. So here's the prefrontal lobe, here's the frontal lobe, and here's the back of the brain. And if we react, if we don't think about what we're doing and something happens and we just have an emotional reaction, if we hit out, if we say bad words, if we start screaming, that's, we are responding from here. But if we actually delay, it takes nine seconds, like the imaging studies now that they do show that in nine seconds, we move from here to here. And if we are acting from here, we're actually thinking about how, what our reaction should be. We're, we're saying to ourselves, uh-oh, I shouldn't do that. I'm going to get in trouble. Or uh-oh, if I do that, that person's going to feel bad and they're going to be angry with me or something like that. So the nine second rule is critical. Um, and um, there are a lot of non, uh, I, I've been um, researching non-medication strategies for ADHD. And what I realized is that a lot of them are using that nine second rule. They are just introducing delay mechanisms in order to give the prefrontal cortex a chance to work. So um, um, there's significant research by a man named uh, Jack Naglieri, N-A-G-L-I-E-R-I, -E -E, that when delay is introduced, students improve their math and reading scores significantly. So just tell, this is an important point, just telling kids to wait nine seconds doesn't do the job. We have to give them something to do during that delay so that they're actually delaying. So you can count to nine, you can sing a song, you can do a dance. Um, you, what Jack does with kids who are, um, he's trying to get them to get to their prefrontal and frontal lobe before they do their math homework. He asks questions like, how do you think you might do this? Do you have a plan? What did you do last time? How did that work out? How come you did it that way? This looks like it might be hard. Is there a way to make it easier? Is there a better way or another way to do it? What strategy worked for you? How can you check your work to see if it's right? Now, you don't really need to remember these questions. They're not that important. It, the, the important thing is that they're questions and that because you're getting them to think about the answers, they're actually not jumping in to do the math homework. And uh, because of the delay, they're then uh, activating the um, higher order thinking of their brain. And that if you do ask the same questions over and over again, it becomes a kind of habit. And eventually kids, when they sit down to do some kind of work, they actually ask themselves a few of these questions. You know, many kids, especially ADHD kids, kids with, that have diagnosed with ADHD, when you give them some work to do, they just sit down and they just wanna get it over with. <laughs> you know, they don't wanna think about it at all which is then not giving their frontal lobes a chance to kick in. And it's also true that children with ADHD don't talk to themselves. They don't sub-vocalize as much. There's lots of research about that. So you're kind of teaching them um, how to talk to themselves about important things. And this is just a little bit of the research that shows that this group um, had, um, well, let's look at this group first. This group was very high to begin with in planning, which means they were pretty good at using their prefrontal and frontal lobes. So even when they stopped and asked them these questions, they improved their math scores by 40%. But when kids were low, where you know mostly kids diagnosed with ADHD, where they're, they're not using their frontal lobe and their prefrontal lobe, that they're the ones who just dive in and you teach them to ask these questions and delay their work, for you know, um, you know, a few minutes, um, their uh, math scores improved 80%. And um, um, this research, Naglieri and Gottling and Naglieri and other people has been replicated over and over and over again. 
We also have a strategy that was developed by Earl's Court in their SNAP program. Many of you are probably familiar with the SNAP program. And, um, you know, um, it's a cutesy little thing that um, they taught young children, probably up to age seven or eight, um, that when they feel angry, they should do three things. Um, cover your mouth so you don't say anything bad. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Put your hands in your pockets so you don't hit anybody and stamp your feet. So you show people how angry you are. So, you know, the idea is that anger needs to be expressed, but you don't want to do anything harmful. And um, many kids really globbed onto this, thought this was great. You know, I, you know they, they really enjoyed using this, but you know, if you think about it, what does it do? It delays, it, it gives them, it puts something in place to do besides just hitting out at other people or saying bad words or all the things that would get you into trouble. And, um, you know, for ADHD too, um, what can we do at home or what can you help parents in, to do at home? Um, we have to restructure the natural settings. We, we can't expect that kids who have a neurological problem, and I should go back to that. Um, what we now know with ADHD is that this part of the brain is really not functioning properly. It's either small, there's, there's lots of, of um, volumes of evidence that show that this part of the brain in some cases is smaller, it's just under functioning when they do the PET scans and they actually see this part of the brain operating, it doesn't light up, it doesn't have as much activity in it. And so if, if you are a person or a child with that deficit, you can't just really expect them to um, you know, learn skills and get over it. What we, what we have to do is change things in their environment so that they can um, um, function better. So more, if, if we put more of the information visually into their environment using post-its and signs, um, then they don't need to connect so much with their, um, you know, because there are, there's this deficit, I'm gonna go back to that brain, um, what Russell Barkley has taught us is that because this is under functioning, uh, this is the stop mechanism of the brain. I had a session yesterday with a girl with ADHD and I explained this as this is the mute button. <laughs> this is the button that says, no, you can't talk right now. Um, and so because kids with ADHD, uh, this isn't working so well, and it's not that it's not working at all, but it's just under, under working that they don't stop themselves long enough to connect with what they know. All that information and, and everything is that their parents have told them, that their teachers have told them, that their um, psychologists and social workers and child workers have told them, they don't stop themselves long enough to connect with what they know. So we have to not expect them to get the information here, but we have to put the information out here on boards, on um, tag, tag boards, on um, post-it notes. We have to externalize the information. We have to externalize the sources of motivation so that, you know, if they're working for something, you know, if they do this, they're gonna get something. Don't expect them to remember that. Put a sign up that shows what they're working for. We need to understand what they're, what they're dealing with and what, the, what their lacks and deficits are and accommodate. Um, as well, kids with ADHD also need activity and stimulation, which may be hard in these times. We, we're actually at a time when we have uh, better weather. Kids can get out and get on their bicycles. Um, uh, there's some people who think that um, the reason that children with ADHD respond to stimulant medication um, is because they need more stimulation. <laughs> Um, so that's one of the theories out there. I tried to stay away from the whole medication issue because they're either on it or not. But all of these things that I've outlined here are things you can do whether kids are on medication or not on medication. Um, I, I, I'm not an expert on autism spectrum, but I will, uh, I do consult with people all of the time. So I will say a few things about this. Um, Kids on the, the autism spectrum need routine even more than other kids do. Um, 
Um, you know, if, if parents are doing schoolwork with them, I, I would suggest that they not worry if, if little is accomplished, tomorrow's another day. My consults with people who actually work with them in the schools, that's how they feel about it, even in a more normal time than we're in now. Um, uh, many kids on the autism spectrum kind of have specific interests um, and they get fixated on them. Um, and schools, they seem to try to incorporate those interests into the work instead of fighting against it. Um, um, I, I would say this is a very important point, spend more time on play-based activities um, because this builds resilience and strengthens the, the bond with parents. Um, all kids want to play, even uh, kids on the autism spectrum. They, they often don't want to play with others, so if you can encourage them to uh, play with you, then you're increasing their capacity to tolerate relationships, which is a, a good thing. Um, try to have a theme for the day, a pajama day, a wacky hair day. I think they like that predictability. Um, ask them to do one, two, or three things, and then they can have their preferred activity. And if video games are the reward, then perhaps encourage them to play with others, encourage their social skills that way, um, strengthen their social connections um, rather than encourage their or allow their isolation. Um, we've talked a little bit about anger, but I wanted to get back to it because um, kids uh, during this time of being cooped up, spending more time with their siblings may be increasing their anger issues. Um, one of the things that I always tell kids about anger is that it's a very important emotion. Um, anger is not something we want to get rid of because anger is something that tells us that something's not right, something's not fair, something needs to change. Um, so by saying that, you're validating their feelings of anger. But because it's such an important emotion, because we want others to hear us, you know, if we, we have to learn how to express anger in the right way. So if we don't express it in the right way, if we shout, if we hit, if we say bad words, if we break things, then people just get angry back. And they don't hear what the, the whole reason that we were angry in the first place. The reason that we got angry got lost. So if we want others to hear us, then we have to learn to express it in the right way. And um, Again, it goes back to that picture of the brain. If we express it from the back of our brain, from the primitive parts of our brain, we don't use our words or we use the wrong words, we use the hurtful words, we just emote and react um, and others don't hear us and they just get angry back. So the whole reason that we got angry in the first place is lost. So um, they just get angry because of the way we're expressing it. So if we delay just a bit, Again, that delay mechanism, and we talked about that. We can then you know, speak from our prefrontal and frontal lobes, and then we can be heard. And there's a better chance that the problem might get solved. There's no guarantee, there's no guarantees in life, but if we stop and say, okay, what am I gonna do about this? I'm really angry. How am I gonna get heard about this? We have a chance. And uh, you know, I use words like, do you want people to take you seriously? Do you want people to take your concerns seriously? Then we have to learn to express anger appropriately. And you know, let's not minimize this. This is not an easy task for anybody. There are a lot of adults there who have um, struggled with this and get frustrated and are yelling all the time. So this is something we can teach adults as well. Um, helping children with depression or feelings of loss and grief. Um, you know, there are many kids who started this pandemic being depressed, didn't get depressed, but started being depressed. And this whole situation has just made their situation worse. There are many children who have been dealing, were dealing with loss and grief even before the pandemic or during the pandemic. So, um, you know, these are just, uh, these are general, uh, it's, it's often difficult. You know, sometimes kids don't express depression the way adults do. They don't get quiet. Sometimes they get loud and noisy. Sometimes they look hyperactive. They're trying to fight against that depressed, depressed feelings. But it's important for children to know they're not alone, that there's a caring adult in their life. 
and help them to express their feelings in some nonverbal way. Even kids who are verbal have difficulty expressing difficult feelings verbally, you know, finding the right words. So they, they're more comfortable expressing themselves through behavior. Kids often express their, through, their feelings through behavior or through drawing or through role play or through their play. Um, you know, so observe their play, uh, try to engage into some role playing with them, comment on their behavior, let them know you understand how, how they feel. You know, you might say something like, you're not talking much, you're not doing much, I'm thinking, you might be feeling sad. You know, it's okay to make guesses with kids. They let us know when we're right and wrong. If you hit the mark, they'll, they'll nod. If you're not, if you're wrong, they'll, they'll tell you and you just keep guessing. Um, it does help the brain when adults label feelings. You know, when kids are in a stress state and we label those feelings, there are changes that happen in the brain. Feelings let up when they are identified with words. Um, and then let's not forget that we may not be able to make the sadness go away, but we can lighten up a bit. You know, if, if, um, you know, if you ask kids to rate on a 10 point scale, how they feel, and if they're at a 10 and you say, well, what can we do to make you get, maybe we can get you to an eight or a seven, you know, um, milk and cookies, um, sing a song, uh, go for a walk, uh, watch a video. It, it's okay to try to cheer ourselves up and cheer others up a bit, even if we don't get 100% of where we're getting to, we sometimes can make things a bit better. Um, and by doing that, we're introducing as much, a little bit of hopefulness as we can while staying real. Um, I also wanted to mention um, that child abuse uh, is on the increase. Um, suicidal feelings are on the increase. They're more at risk now, especially for children who are in at-risk situations. Um, uh, people are making much fewer trips to the family doctor or the pediatrician. And, you know, the pediatricians and the family docs are often the ones to pick up abuse. They see the marks. None of that is happening now. Um, and if you are having contact with your um, families and kids, be hypervigilant, hyper pay attention to very small hints of possible abuse. If kids let out anything, you know, ask about it. You know, if they're feeling really sad, you know, and, and not talking and crying a lot, ask them if they're thinking about suicide. Don't be afraid to ask that question. Um, Children who, um, or if they, if they mention that they've been hit, please, um, or, you know, or abused in any way, um, sexual or physical, please um, try to pursue those things um, um, and, and report it to the authorities. Children who have experienced trauma, significant losses may also be at higher risk. Um, their well-being is connected to their current social supports. And if they've lost them, or if their social supports are not as supportive for whatever reason, if they're going through um, health crises or uh, psychological crises or financial crises, they may not be as available to the children. Um, and children may be more isolated. Um, I think we're all feeling very isolated and those that isolation is putting kids at more risks. So um, please use the tools that are, that are outlined here. You don't need a diagnosis. Um, you know, we, we basically want to help kids with their symptoms, the ones that they're uncomfortable about and the ones that they wanna get rid of. So I wanted to leave you with um, um, this final thought from A.A. A. Milne um, that you can share and uh, with your clients or, or apply to yourself. Um, it says, promise me, You'll always remember that you're braver than you believe, stronger than you seem, and smarter than you think. And that applies to everybody. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to stop the screen and um, um, so that I can get back to this screen. And I think we have some, probably some questions uh, in the chat. Hi, Mandy. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Alter. That was uh, really interesting. And um, I'm sure that um, the folks on the line uh, appreciated uh, 
um, in particular pointing out that um, child abuse is on the rise and that we all have our, our part to play in just ensuring that we're recognizing those signs and symptoms. Yeah. So really we need to remember that we are all the advocates for children. That's yeah. right. Uh, so looking at some questions, we've got a question related to night terrors. wonder if you can oh. speak to um, if you've got any tips on night terrors. Um, well, you know, the, the, it's an interesting one. Um, the um, night terrors where kids get up and walk around and they're shaking, you know, they're, they're often stuck in a, in a bad dream. And um, the advice from the sleep, the people that study sleep is don't try to wake them up, just get them back to sleep. You know, um, that, um, um, you know, it, it, there, there is a substance that your body emits, and I can't remember what it's called, um, but it paralyzes us. You know, it um, because we all have bad dreams, and if we didn't have this substance, we'd be running around or trying to get out the door, you know, or um, um, and some people actually emit more of it than others. You know, some people are more chatty in their dreams, but kids, some kids, and many kids don't really emit much of that. It's something that increases as we get older, so therefore, that's why they are reacting to their dreams right mm -hmm. but um you know it's nothing to be concerned about kids uh, grow out of it but they do look very distressed <laughs> because they're in a bad dream and the best way to handle it is to just um help them to get back to sleep you know and um you know it's it's usually pointless to try to talk to them in the morning they don't even remember it there's no um recognition so um you know, the other thing is that they're in a very sound sleep. <laughs> My terrors occur when kids are really sleeping soundly. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so somebody is asking me who did the research on the nine second rule and I got it from Dan Siegel. Mm -hmm. Dan, um, so I hope that answers that question. Right. <laughs> he, he's a, a pediatric neurologist in California. He's written lots of books. Uh, mm -hmm. wonderful books and um, you know works very closely with children from a neuropsychological point of view explaining to them how you know all of these things relate to their brain function mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay got another question on sleep um, any advice on how to convince tweens and teens and just how important sleep is absolutely now you can say that you know, one of the things I just read a book called "Why Sleep Matters." It was mm -hmm. it was on the bestseller list in the New York Times. I said, you know, I should read that. I couldn't put it down. It was a page turner. So, so many good things happen to you when you're asleep, and don't happen the rest of the time. One of the things is that it 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 strength your immune system strengthens, and if we ever needed our immune system strengthening, we need it now. So everybody's aware that we're in a pandemic and we need to have an immune system. So that is number one. The other thing that happens when you sleep is that whatever you learn during the day gets um, filed into your brain. If you want to remember the things you're learning, you have to sleep. Mm -hmm. And you know, and then you wake up and everything is kind of sorted through. And so we learn, you know, our memory improves. We, um, you know, for young kids, they're growing, you know, while they're sleeping, you, uh, your, your immune system. So uh, sleep is extremely important for all of your functioning. If you want to be a happy person, get enough good sleep mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and a healthy at, person. And we're at, at this time, I mean, there's more opportunity to potentially sleep in. So I'm thinking about, so for some of these tweens and teenagers. Um, and, and somebody just asked, does it matter when you sleep? Yes, the, the, um, the sleep that you get when you first go to sleep is not as important as the sleep that you have right before you wake up like the three let's say you get up at eight o'clock from five in the morning until eight is the the time that the sleep is the most important and also if you miss sleep you can't really catch up you mm -hmm. don't get the same benefit from catching mm -hmm. up on your sleep so you know we all need to be getting lots of sleep during this time <laughs> yeah and i'd encourage um folks to take a look at um uh, diana breacher's uh webinar 
that is uh, on thriving at this time. She had a really great diagram on the sleep cycle and, um, and how we sort of move in and out of that. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, um, thinking a little bit more about loss, uh, any additional recommendations for resources supporting young, young children dealing with loss during this time? Um, well, I, 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 maybe you could get that person's name because I have a great book about uh, children and grief, which I, it's not on the tip of my tongue, but it's behind me in, in one of those books. Mm. Um, you know, um, many children don't deal with grief the way adults expect them to. And they interpret their lack of response in a wrong way. You know, children live in the here and now. They, they're not thinking so much about the future. Maybe the anxious kids who have a lot of anxiety do, but a lot of other kids don't. So they miss people in the moment, you know? Like if something comes up, you know, all of a sudden I have to go to my baseball practice and dad's not here, I miss dad and I'm gonna cry for dad. But I'm not gonna sit here today and baseball's not happening and think about that. Whereas an adult might, you know, the mm -hmm. adult is thinking, oh, you know, what's gonna happen when baseball comes and dad's not gonna be there for baseball. But kids deal with grief in the moment, not so much, you know, like I went to a funeral once and there was a three-year-old boy who had just lost his dad. And he was dancing, you know, he, wa he wasn't a, a sad little three-year-old, but the adults were apoplectic because we all stood there and said, he doesn't even know how much he's gonna miss his dad. You know, his entire life is ahead of him and he won't have his dad there. That's what we think. That's not what he was thinking, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes grief is a delayed reaction. It comes, you know, I've, I've seen uh, people who lost their parents, they, they had a delayed reaction when they went away to university. All of a sudden they became very depressed. Here they are on their own for their first time and grieving, you know? Um, I, when I lost my dad, I was in the middle of my internship I didn't have time to think. And then I left that and I, I went to stay with a friend and I spent months grieving for my dad. But that was a year later. I didn't have time, you know, when it happened. And so mm -hmm. I, I, I delayed it. So, you know, this often happens with children. They don't react the way we expect them to. And then we think, oh, that didn't matter. It's mm -hmm. not that it doesn't matter. It's that they're developmentally not organized that way you know, and it, it, it will matter to them at different points and they will show it. And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a protective factor that they're not grieving, that they're not thinking about the whole picture, you know, that they still can go to school and do their work and play with their friends and not lose their childhood because of it. Now, if children are grieving and, you know, there are some kids who operate more like adults and if they do have the big picture, then you know we have to give them opportunities to express it, to write letters to the person, to tell that person, you know how much they love them, to go to the where they're buried, to give offerings, you know, to express their love. And you know the other thing that was mentioned in that book that I thought was so good is that sometimes parents don't want to talk about the the, the loss because they think it'll be too hard on the kid. But if you stop talking about that person then they really lose that person. Mm -hmm. you know, there, there are ways that we can hold on to people and stay in our lives forever in helpful ways. You know, what do we remember about them? What, what did they teach us? We certainly want to hold on to our love for them and their love for us. We don't ever have to lose that. You know, we can keep them in our hearts forever and hopefully we do. Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, uh, and keep them in our memories and talk about them. So, you know, you have to deal with all of these situations uh, uh, uniquely, you know, every person is different and every person needs a different thing, but we can consider all of these factors. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know we have gone over, but uh, I think that this is really interesting and important. So I, I do want to see if we can uh, get to a few more questions. Um, so, Dr. Alter, as you know, we work a lot with teachers, and so there are teachers that are concerned about how to help children, uh, their students, adjust as they come back to school. And, you know, we don't even know what school is going to look like uh, come September. Oh, my God. Um, but do you have any <laughs> strategies on how, how to focus, um, uh, how, how to encourage students to focus over the, in, in, the, in the first few weeks of school? 
Okay, somebody asked me for the name of the book. It's called Why Sleep Matters. It okay. was on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, mm -hmm. Back to school. The, the real question is, are they going back to school now in June or are they going back in September? Because in September, and we don't know, I, you know, I, I, we don't know what the situation is going to be, um, how we're going to keep our kids safe. Um, you know, I, I don't think I can answer that question except to say um, that um, we need to find out you know, we need to give kids an opportunity to tell us what, what they experienced, how they dealt with this all, um, mm -hmm. you know, reconnect with each other. Um, I don't think we need to dive right in on day one with all the work and the curriculum. There's a, there's a whole emotional learning that needs to happen here. There's so much to be learned from this experience. And my hope is that we don't end it without having learned it. Mm -hmm. And, um, um, you know, the teachers can talk about what they've learned, you know, one of the things I've learned is that, you know, th there are advantages to staying home, there's advantages of slowing down, you know, we learned what was important to us, our relationships with others, there's all kinds of good um, knowledge and, and w wisdom that is being learned here. Um, that sometimes we have to listen to experts that they know more than we do. It's a big lesson for kids who may not have always trusted their teachers and authority, but have learned that, you know, we do need science. You know, maybe we can encourage some budding scientists out of this all, you know, kids to, to follow careers as scientists. You know, one of the things I have always done is ask the kids that I see what they want to do when they grow up. And I have to report after asking this question over 5,000 times, in the last five to seven years, I get very, have gotten very few kids who want to be doctors and scientists. And mm. maybe after this pandemic, we may have more, and that would be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right? Every yeah. kid, especially the boys, all want to be video game designers. Now, we may still have some of those because probably kids spend a lot of time playing video games, but they also spend a lot of time paying attention to, um, you know, what's happening in the world and our reliance on science. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we've got a question about the nine second rule and asking questions. So um, Fran wants to know if asking these questions might interfere with the processing of information um, during well, those evidently nine seconds. Evidently it doesn't. I mean, that's what Jack Naglier, I mean, he has done that, he, that kind of an experiment with I'm, like he's, he, you can check him out. He's got so many publications in so many different situations and his approach is to ask these questions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and then after the adult asks the question, the teacher usually asks these questions or the, um, the psychologist who's working with them, then eventually the kids start asking those questions themselves. But the idea is that they don't, um, you, you're not doing this while they're listening to a lecture. You're doing this while they have a piece of work in front of them that they're about to do, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to give them a little bit more time to think about what they're, I, I remember when I was a kid, I hated that. I hated when, when they would say, okay, think about this before you jump in. And I was too anxious. You know, I wanted to just do it and get it over with, right? So, um, you know, by sitting there with them and asking them, asking the questions, um, um, you know, there's another woman, um, Sean Belock, S-I-A-N-B-E-I-L-O-C-K, who works with performance anxiety, and she does some similar things. She gets people to, before they take a test, to sit and write down all their worries. It's a little bit like that worry box. Get rid of the worries in your head, and then they take the test, and the people that do that um, get a grade and a half better than the people who don't. And she has replicated that with hundreds and thousands of, of students at the University of Chicago. Um, so there's so many examples of this where we delay the, the responses and the outcomes are so much better. Mm. Right? Okay. That pause. Okay, maybe just one more question. This is related. Well, I think you, you, just, you just said pause, and I think this whole pandemic has been a big pause hmm. for all of us, you know? And hopefully when we go back to our lives, we will also have benefited. And, it, you know, it might be a good time to say, 
what do I want to take with me? You know, it's, do I want to just jump back in or do I want to jump back in in a different way into our lives? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Lots to think about there. People are saying they can't find the book. Mm -hmm. um, I have to get my... Um, we can um, we can follow up. Follow up. Uh, we can, it, we can provide definitely... that, the name and the author uh, in the email that people will receive. Why do we sleep? Afternoon. Maybe if, go to the New York Times bestseller list and just type in sleep. I think it will probably come up. Okay. Uh, Why we've got do a we question. Sleep, maybe. Why we sleep? Unclocking, unlocking the power of sleep and dreams by Matthew Walker. That's it. Thank That's you, it. Veronica. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, so, question on um, on OCD. So, I know we didn't talk about this. Um, do you have any thoughts so I, on? Yeah, OCD. On I believe, after working with many kids, is really a, a neurological disorder. I know it's it's classified as an anxiety disorder, mm -hmm. but kids with OCD can it's very very difficult to get control of it without some medication i refer them to psychiatrists who specialize in this okay and there are only certain drugs that actually target ocd but okay. even you know like the person that wrote the book the brain that changes itself hmm. um, norman deutsch norman okay. deutsch he his chapter on ocd he worked with somebody like norman went around the planet interviewing and reporting on people that are working to change the brain. And uh, it can be done. It requires a lot of repetition and a lot of time. And mm -hmm. with the OCD person, it also required medication. Like you can teach people not to listen to their OCD thoughts, but only if it's calmed down a bit and they're not, they're not so um, strong that they can't resist them. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how severe it is. But, um, you know, I, I do um, think when it's severe that kids need some medication to help them with it. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, so um, how about one more question as far as the, um, we spoke a lot about routine and how important that is. So I'm wondering, um, Dr. Alter, if you can speak a little bit more about the balance between routine and for a young person who might be experiencing depression and anxiety. Um, well, I'm not sure what the question, I mean, we don't want to have a completely routine, routine, routinized life. Mm -hmm. There's got to be time for free play. And in fact, there's more time for free play now. You know, when, when I go for my distance walks in my neighborhood, my street looks like, um, the 1950s when kids were out with their bicycles and, you know, just doing what they feel like doing, you know, no routine. So, you know, it's important, you know, like if you have like an hour a day where you do some work, um, an hour a day where you do some self-care, where you take a bath or, um, you know, kids can be learning, you know, many different age groups can help out in the kitchen and learn some skills of cleaning up and um, uh, contributing to the, um, um, the family meals. But then time for play, you know, time mm -hmm. for, um, you know, just free time. And if kids are depressed, that's probably the time that they will not like the most, you know, because depressed mm -hmm. kids like to be told what to do and, you know, they feel comfort in the routine. And so if you notice that kids are not happy when it's free, free play and are really at a loss, might be a sign of depression. And so play with them, you know, spend some time with them. Um, you know, see what's comfortable, do some drawing, do some not, you know, less active activity, but um, uh, play a board game, um, um, you know, do something like that that's uh, comforting. Okay, okay, great. Okay. Um, so I, I wanted to thank you so much for, uh, for once again sharing your your knowledge, your wisdom with us. I uh, really appreciate it, Dr. Alter. Um, we do have a few more questions, but I'm, I think that we can follow up afterwards. Okay. Okay. And I really Thank appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. It. Thank you for being here and for all your mm -hmm. questions and your attention. And, um, you know, good luck with, everybody, with everything. Excellent. Um,
Yeah, and I and I, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, and thank everybody for extending your time with us today. You will be receiving the recording and the slide. So, um, and in addition to some of the resources that we've mentioned, so we'll be sure to include that. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that um, as a charity, the Psychology Foundation of Canada does rely on donations. So, if it is within your means uh, to contribute, it allows us to continue to to do this kind of work and to continue to nurture resilience in children. So thank you very much for all the yeah. work that you're doing. I would just reiterate that and say, you know, even a small donation, you know, there are many people on this webinar, you know, we have a thing now called crowdfunding. And, you know, if you can give five or $10, you know, multiplied by 500, we can bring more programs and do more of our work. And, uh, um, you know, so if you found this valuable, please uh, feel free. And we hope that you can give us a little bit. We are, and, and on that note, just very briefly, we are actually involved in a, a the Great Canadian Charity Challenge. So that for every uh, dollar that is donated, our um, name, the Psychology Foundation of Canada, is put into a draw, and we have the possibility of winning twenty thousand dollars, which would make a huge difference. As so how can as people us. donate? Do they go to the website? They can go to the website. They um, they can see it in the um, the signature of uh, all of the Psychology Foundation of Canada uh, staff. Uh, member. So Pamela Sarianis is, is going to be emailing everyone. So you'll see it right at the bottom. Um, but we'll, we'll also make sure that uh, it's, it's very clear for people to donate. Okay. okay. Great. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Stay safe. Stay strong. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.